I'm here today with Esther Abanga, who is from Nigeria and is a Christian pastor. Pastor Esther leads an organization called Women Without Walls in Plateau State, which has seen a lot of violence. And through this organization, she has worked tirelessly to bring an end to the violence and to protect and empower girls and women who have suffered particular challenges with the rise of various forms of extremist violence throughout the country. So we have a few questions for you today, Pastor Esther. Mm -hmm. One is I want to note, congratulations, you Thank were recently you awarded the prestigious Noano Peace Prize, which yes. is awarded every year by a Japanese Buddhist organization to much. recognize a religious peace builder of distinction. Um, and you were awarded this for your efforts to work across religious lines of difference mm -hmm. in northern Nigeria to prevent violence and extremism and to protect and empower girls and women. So I wonder if you could begin by please telling us a little bit about your approach to that work. Okay, thank you very much, Susan, for having me here. Um, <clears throat> like you must have known, um, Plateau State, and in particular the city of Jos, has been embroiled in religious um, violence and conflicts for the past three decades almost. And um, we originally were totally uninvolved as women. But in 2010, a village close to where I lived uh, was attacked and... Um, by militants and they killed about 530 women and children and that became a turning point for me and so I got together with some Christian women and I felt it was time to step out of church and onto the street and so we led a protest rally to the government and there were about a hundred thousand women that came out the Muslim women responded that their own people were killed as well which was true you know and they had their own rally we had our two rallies and the killings did not stop. So I decided to reach out to the Muslim woman because I felt the issues were not really religious, they were political, but religion was used as a powerful tool. And I felt we must bring down the wall of religion because religion divides, but it can also unite. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to my Muslim counterpart and we formed one Women Without Walls initiative. And so we took a common stand to refuse to allow religion to be used to perpetrate evil. And so we decided to work with young people that are prone to violence and also uh, quite vulnerable to recruitment by um, extremists. We decided to work with them. And, you know, our, our thinking is if we can reduce the pool of recruits, that way we would control um, the number of people that are radicalized or are given to terrorism. And so we started to work with four volatile communities with the young people basically, engaging them, talking with them, and seeing how we can get them productively engaged so they can uh, say no to violence. So one aspect of your identity is that you're a woman, um, but another aspect that sets you apart is that you're a religious leader. Yes. And I wonder if you can share with us what you think religious leaders are particularly well situated mm -hmm. to do to prevent and counter extremism, and then also um, what role women clergy might play that is different from male religious leaders. Okay. Maybe I'll start with your second question, okay. women clergy, because... Um, Initially, it wasn't an accepted thing in my society and also, um, well, culturally and also within the religious circle, they believe a woman should be seen and not heard. Having said that, we now got, by the grace of God, to a place where we are respected in the community because we have proven our worth. Mm -hmm. So when this issue of um, countering extremist violence came you know, and I found myself pushed into it because, like I said, initially I wasn't involved. But when they killed those women and children, I said, no, there's no way I can sit down and let that happen. So we came out. What that has done is, for the first time, religious actors are seen to be actively involved outside of the church, mm -hmm. stepping out of the church coming into the society, coming into the level of the society to bring solutions to our social problems. And I think that's very important because for too long we've been locked up in the church. Light is meant for the dark. Mm -hmm. It's meant for the dark places. And it's meant for darkness. So we need to step out into the dark arenas and bring light. 
And I think that's where the religious leaders have a major role to play. And that we have done in engaging these young people who have been able to counsel, to love, and to pray with these young people. And for me, it's, for me, this is the greatest part of my ministry, not the 20 years that I've been in church, but actually going on the street and seeing lives change and transform. The greatest testimony I had is a couple of months after we started, one of the Muslim boys in the community sent me a text and he said, Mother, I want you to know that I love you. And I've treasured that text. I have refused to delete it. It's in my phone till this day. I've never, and I've never preached to him. I've never said, come and be a Christian or anything. But, they, you know, for a Muslim boy to call me mother, for me, is the greatest blessing of how, an in, you know, um, religious leaders, if they play it right, they can have a very positive impact, you know, on the society as a whole but particularly on the, the, the group of young people who are prone to, you know, violence or radicalism or extremism, we need to really focus on that group of people because they are needy. That's where a lot of the religious leaders and prophets and the people from our religious traditions that we hear yes. in the past, they all spent time in the world, not yes, inside absolutely. walls. Yeah. So I know we have um, Nigeria's elections coming up. And your work has um, put pressure on some of Nigeria's government and worked closely with the police to, to help counter Boko Haram and other extremist groups in Nigeria. Um, what will the new government need to do to address the threat um, in Nigeria? And what do you think can be done to help prevent election-related violence from taking place? Since we started engaging the communities, we've now built a relationship with them and they've basically become partners with us, all the young people there. So this year, when the election um, date was initially fixed, about sometime in January, the youths from a particular volatile community came to me and they said to me, Pastor Esther, I want you and the women to come to our community and do a campaign against election violence. We know that if you come and talk to us, the young people will listen to you. So this time around, we're not going. They're coming, they're actually coming and inviting mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that was such a breakthrough for me. I was so excited. Mm -hmm. I think they are all looking for solutions. You know, the population, the society, they want answers, they want peace. They want to move on with their lives. There are multifaceted, you know, factors that have been given as to why Boko Haram has thrived in Nigeria for so long. I think the fundamental issue has been the willpower for the government to actually take a decisive action. I think the government has allowed it to go on for so long, maybe because of political considerations, and of course there's also the issue of corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, Nigeria is the biggest country in Africa, one of the biggest, you know, um, population in the world, the, the seventh biggest. How can we have an army that cannot contend? How, how did we get here? How did we let it go this far? You know, so I really think that uh, the next government that's coming, this is the for me, this is the item number one on their table. They need to deal with this. And it can be dealt with as long as the political will is there and they're sincere. And they work closely with civil society leaders. And well, thank you for chipping that in. Yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And they work with civil society leaders. You're so right. I have one final question for you. Yes, um, you have participated in the last couple of years with the USIP's Women Preventing Extremist Violence Program, and you've been here in Washington, D.C. over the past few days engaging with women leaders from throughout the world, including countries that are very different from Nigeria, who are addressing similar issues. I wonder if you can share with us a little bit about um, what you've learned through the program or how the program has benefited you in your work, and also what you've learned engaging with these other women leaders from around the world in the past few days. It's really been a fantastic opportunity for me to be here in USIP. And um, there's always so much to learn from other people. And I have learned a lot uh, in engaging with um, the women from Indonesia, Pakistan, 
and India and Kenya, you know. Um, some of the things I have learned is the, um, the power of using not just the social media, but media is a very, very powerful tool in um, maybe increasing the spread of our work and what we do. So I really think that, um, for example, the lady from India talked about her radio program, mm -hmm. you know, and how she has used it effectively for women to send out the right messages, you know, and that's something I think we can bring on board in the Nigerian instance. And also in engaging with the police, you know, um, I have found out that in certain instances they have taken it a step further to parliament, mm -hmm. you know, and I think um, that's what we need to start considering in Nigeria as well. We are inspired by your work and the work, of, the work that you're doing with your Christian and Muslim sisters and brothers mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me here. Mm -hmm.